So welcome everybody to tonight's Planet Now webinar. Um, my name is Sophie Moore. I'm a postdoc in the Center for Environmental Studies um, and the Humanities Research Center here at Rice. I am also playing the role tonight of Joseph Campana, who can't be here because we are in Houston and he does not have power or internet. So again, um, thank you everybody for being here this evening. Um, I welcome you to this webinar. I'll tell you a little bit about the Center for Environmental Studies. The center is anchored in the schools of humanities and architecture. I would like to offer a few thank yous to deans Kathleen Canning and John Kasparian. Also thank you to the Humanities Research Center and thank you to the Mellon Foundation Diluvial Houston Grant for funding um, this webinar. Also thank you to the, to the Department of Modern and Classical Literature and Culture. I want to let you all know our webinars are usually on Mondays at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Our next event is going to be on Monday, March 1st. It is on the topic of cultures and media of environmental health. Um, and our guests will be Heather Hauser, Muti Austin, and Alexis Shotwell from Carleton University. So we very much hope to see you all there. And you'll see also in the chat, uh, my colleague has added the uh, Center of Environmental Studies website where you can always find updated information about our events and about the center. So again, thank you everybody for being here. We are recording this event. Um, and before I launch into the discussion with our guests, I wanted to start by acknowledging that the land that Rice University occupies and from which I'm joining you this evening is the ancestral homeland of the Atacapa, Karankawa, Mariame, and Akukisa people on which they thrived for more than 12,000 years. The Gulf Coast has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst a number of indigenous peoples, including the Apache, Caddo, Comanche, Kiowa, Cherokee, and Wichita nations. The founding of the Republic and then the state of Texas in 1836 and 1846, respectively, entailed a settler campaign of ethnic cleansing that violently removed native people from their homelands and their life ways along the Gulf Coast. Consequently, the Caddo, Comanche, and Tonkawa are now officially headquartered in present day Oklahoma. Despite that legacy of confinement, removal, and dispossession, Today, this region remains home to the Alabama Cushata tribe of Texas, the Kickapoo traditional tribe of Texas, the Isleta del Sur Pueblo, the Lipa and Apache tribe, and the Texas band of Yaqui Indians. But also like to recognize today the many enslaved and indentured peoples who were forced to dedicate their labor to the construction of what is now Harris County. To these peoples and their descendants, I acknowledge the grave injustices inflicted on them and I recognize the indelible mark of their labor on the creation of this university and the land that it and the city of Houston occupy. So before we move on to today's discussion, I wanted to note that I encountered significant difficulties in seeking information about the indigenous history of Houston. I couldn't locate any Rice University resources pertaining to the indigenous history of the land the university occupies, nor any official statement on that history. So as we launch a conversation tonight about Afro-Indigenous intersections and environmental justice, I want to highlight how that discussion may open some doors towards understanding the history of environmental injustice on stolen land. So I'm so excited for our conversation this evening. Um, before I introduce our guests, I wanna give a little shout out to my students, some of whom are here tonight. So this term I'm teaching Environmental Studies 311, a course called Black and Green, Environmental Justice in the Afro-Americas. I'll also be teaching it in subsequent terms. And in that class, we've been discussing Black people's experience of and organizing around environmental injustice across the Americas. But because the class focuses on the Afro-Americas, we've also necessarily talked about the way that Black and Indigenous geographies overlap in this hemisphere. 
And so it's my students' discussion around the dispossession of native land and life ways and solidarities between black, brown, and native folks that inspired me to this discussion. So thank you to my students. Our three guests tonight have all influenced my thinking around environmental justice in the Afro-Americas. They pushed me towards understanding just how deeply Black and Native struggles are intertwined from the Caribbean to the Great Lakes to the Bay Area. So this evening we aim to talk about those overlapping geographies, some of the specific struggles that have unfolded there, and the ways that our scholarship contends with the injustices wrought by colonialism, empire, and racial capitalism. Planet Now webinars usually go until about 7 or 7.15 central time. After this, I will introduce each of our guests briefly, each of whom will then give us a short orientation to their work, and then I'll facilitate a discussion between the three of them. We'll spend the last 20 minutes or so on Q&A with the audience. Y'all in the audience should have access to the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. You may submit a question at any time, um, and I will moderate those when the time comes. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our guests and then we'll move into our discussion. Michelle Murphy is a professor of history and women and gender studies and Canada research chair in science and technology studies and environmental data justice at the University of Toronto. Murphy also co-directs the Technoscience Research Unit at the University of Toronto. Their most recent book, The Economization of Life, was published in 2017 and in 2019 was awarded the Ludwig Fleck Prize from the Society for Social Studies of Science. Beth Rose Middleton is professor and chair of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. Her research centers on native environmental policy and has addressed intergenerational trauma and healing, rural environmental justice, indigenous analysis of climate change, Afro-indigeneity, and qualitative GIS. Her second book, Upstream, Trust Lands and Power on the Feather River, and the History of Indian Land Rights and Hydroelectric Development in Northeastern California, was published in September 2018. Malcolm Ferdinand is an environmental engineer and political philosopher. He's currently a researcher at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, CNRS, in Paris. His research sits at the crossroad of political philosophy, post-colonial theory, and political ecology, with a focus on the Black Atlantic, and particularly the Caribbean. Some of his recent work has addressed Chlordicon contamination in Martinique and the French Antillean uprisings of 2009. His book, Une écologie décoloniale, Pensée l'écologie depuis le monde caribéen, was published in 2019. So big warm welcome to our guests from Chile, Houston. Um, and I suppose I will awkwardly just say the order in which you are to introduce yourselves. If you could each just tell us a little bit about your current work or however you'd like to, to orient us to your entry point into the discussion. We could start with Murphy. Thank you, Sophie, and thank you um, to Joseph and everyone who helped to uh, make this evening possible. Um, I'm Michelle Murphy, and um, I'm uh, Métis from Winnipeg, and I'm a science and technology studies scholar, and most of what my work is about right now is um, the lower Great Lakes and the relationship between colonialism, pollution, and um, technoscience, uh, particularly with a focus on an area called Chemical Valley, where some 40% of Canada's petrochemicals are refined, and which is on Anishinaabe territory, and particularly is on um, the land of Amjanong First Nation. And so um, the work we do is um, lab-based, it's collaborative, it involves um, academics and community researchers um, working together um, to kind of do land defense against some, uh, in an area where there's been some 150 years of petrochemical um, pollution. 
Go on to Dr. Willis, please. Thank you so much. I can't tell you all how excited I am to be in conversation with these scholars. And thank you for that beautiful and grounding introduction, Sophie, to this series and to how it developed. So I'm speaking to you from Putwin Homelands in Central California in Davis. And I, uh, I come from not far from here. My, well, my family is Afro-Caribbean and Eastern European. Uh, but I was born and raised here in the Sierra foothills. So behind me is a landscape very similar to where I grew up and I'll speak about it a little bit in the course of our conversation. I'm working right now uh, principally on water and fire in particular the dam removal processes. I'm very interested in indigenous led dam removals and fire, uh, the application of, of cultural burning as a, as a landscape stewardship tool that expresses indigenous environmental ethics and also is an important climate adaptation strategy and has been so for a long time. I also have ongoing work with land trusts, native land trusts, land trusts as, as vehicles for land rematriation and repatriation and environmental health, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on in the course of this conversation. I just finished a, a paper, a more historical paper, trying to identify some of the legal connections that enabled uh, slavery in context of emancipation in California, uh, in early statehood, and uh, in the post-emancipation South. And I'm also working on trying to bring considerations of intergenerational trauma and healing into forest and climate policy. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Um, so good evening, everyone. It's um, it's a pleasure to be here as well, um, even at this uh, late hour. I, I I was very also pleased to to hear the the, the crowding presentation by, by by Sophie. It's uh, it's really humbling. Um, so one of the things, a few things I would like to share. I'm, my name is Malcolm. I'm, you can hear my French accent. I can't hide it. Um, I was born and raised in Martinique, um, Caribbean island, and I'm speaking to you currently from, from Paris. Um, my current work at the moment, um, I, I would highlight three areas. One is I'm doing a more in-depth work on this uh, um, Kipom, this Claudicum, this Kipom contamination in Martinique and Guadeloupe, but also in other places in, in the world, including Africa, Europe, and Asia. The same, the same molecule. So I'm doing a, a, I'm working on a book project on that. Um, secondly, I'm trying to accompany the publication of my latest book, um, Decolonial Ecology, in which I challenge the, um, let's say the, the, the classical history of environmental thought, environmental theory, and a, a history that has historically uh, neglected the presence and the voices and the experiences of, um, of indigenous people, but also and particularly um, pe people of African descent. Um, and looking at it from a French perspective as well, which, is, which has this particular twist. And finally, um, I'm working with a few other colleagues to create a, a kind of activist research center to, to be able to foster, to emulate, to, um, to push for a safe space in which we can talk about um, intersections of environmental issues, environmental justice, and uh, post-colonial, decolonial studies. Just to give you a few context, um, last, last uh, yesterday, the Minister of Higher Education uh, in France just said that uh, she's going to order an inquiry to the people like me who do some research like that at, at universities. Yeah, so. There you go. Well, thank you everybody for your introductions. I'm really struck by um, the affinity between everybody's work. Um, I'm really excited for this for this conversation. I guess we can just dive in. I have some I have some questions to orient our discussion, but you should all feel free to respond however you wish or to add on to each other um, as you wish. 
So because you know, we have in our audience people from all different disciplines, academics and non-academics, uh, practitioners, many people attend our Planet Now webinars, um, going to start with a pretty straightforward question just about environmental justice as it informs each of your work in different ways. And I'm wondering if you can each talk about what the term environmental justice means to you and what has shaped your thinking about it. Um, maybe could Beth Rose, would you start? And then if anyone wants to follow before I call on you, go ahead. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, so I, I tend to start with environmental justice in terms of thinking about those two categories of procedural justice and distributive justice. So for distributive justice, the unequal distribution of harms that some communities bear the brunt of development or of pollution, uh, that it's not evenly spread around, around society. Uh, and I see many examples of this in my work. Uh, mercury contamination, for example, is something that in California is left over from gold mining, from the gold rush. Um, and some people are more exposed than others. If you live a, a subsistence lifestyle, if you fish locally, if you harvest uh, basketry plants and you process them in your mouth, you may be more exposed to chemicals in the environment and to heavy metals in the environment than someone who's living a more, a more distant lifestyle from the local environment. So environmental justice is often thought of in a urban context. I think about it frequently in a rural context. And one of those rural issues is that those chemicals, those pollutants distributed over the environment in an area where people tend to rely more on the local environment. And then the procedural aspect is being able to be at the table when decisions are made around land management, about mitigation, about the use of chemicals, about infrastructure. And lately I've been thinking less about being at the table and more about moving the table uh, because so often decisions are made in urban centers or actually wherever a, a corporation maybe is headquartered and generally really far from where the impacts are felt. And I, I like to see more of policymakers going and listening, going to the sites where people are feeling the most impacts and just listening and then reflecting on how the interests of people in those places and their particular life ways and their histories are not reflected in the policies that are supposed to be protecting environmental health of the entire population, for example. And then the other element I've been thinking about in terms of environmental justice is indigenous environmental justice. I've been reading Dina Jillia Whitaker's book, As Long As Grass Grows, with my classes for the last couple of years since it came out. And she does a very powerful framing of indigenous environmental justice as not separate from settler colonialism, as intertwined. You know, so sometimes we talk about the environmental justice movement as really developing in the 70s and eight or the 80s and 90s, you know, and, and growing to the to the strength that it has today. And she calls us to think more deeply further back about the you know disruption of people's relationship to place the the removals as constitutive of a foundation of environmental injustice that hasn't been addressed that needs to be addressed at the very fundamental levels of how society is is structured and functions malcolm are you ready yeah, I can, I can go. I mean, um, it, it, it matters a lot, the, the place from, from where you, you start with um, environmental justice. And for me, environmental justice as a whole, as a field, open up different ways of understanding ecological issues. Um, being interested in philosophy, especially studying in mainland France, it was, we, we, we come to learn or to talk about ecological issues in terms of environmental ethics. And in a way that depoliticizes ecological issues, whether in terms of access to, to decision or, or unequal distribution of harm or, or environmental yields. And more precisely, it allowed me to connect two subjects that throughout my education had been kept separate. The subject of, the subjects of racism 
colonialism, imperialism, and the subject of environmental studies, environmental issues. Um, and so especially seeing some of the early lips or early um, um, interest of environmental justice in terms of fighting against environmental racism. <clears throat> and so that has opened up to me the possibility to understand the ecological damages or pollutions that I could see in my homeland, Martinique, or in my homelands, or, but also in the other non-sovereign territories of France. You know, France has about 12 non-sovereign territories that are mainly the remains of its former colonial empires. And that suffers enormously in terms of their exposure to some to either uh, climatic events like hurricanes, um, but also uh, pollution. For instance, Martinique and, our, and La Réunion, which is an island in the Indian Ocean, they have the most uh, intensive use of uh, Roundup glyphosate, glyphosate in, in, the whole of, um, in, in the whole of France. And one, one telling story is that these um, non-sovereign territories, they, they harbor about 2.4 million people, but they hold 80, 80%, 80, 80% of the French biodiversity, 98% of the waters of France. France is the second, second uh, country in the world in terms of water area, but yet they are barely talked about uh, when you talk about ecological issues, when you talk about who gets to have a say, who gets to, to decide to take a place. So, so environmental justice has been a term that, that has allowed me to engage with these um, inequalities in, in, in a very productive manner. And it's, and it's, it, it's a struggle also because the, the tenants of the environmental thinking in France had been reluctant to use environmental justice. They, they use terms like uh, unequal, um, une ecological inequalities or unequal distribution, but the, the, the word justice is powerful in itself. And now it's getting, it's, it's starting to, to be more and more used, but still there is a tendency to use it in a just um, like a technical law term. You know, and, and, and the political struggles that yielded this, this, this expression has been somewhat left aside, <laughs> especially the, the struggle against racism, because on that side of the Atlantic, there's a tendency to think that racism is only in the Americas and not in France. So it has, it has been like a really an important tool to, to bridge the two separate subjects that I, I'm interested in. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I really liked how you put that the word justice is powerful in itself. I think that it's an important link to what Beth Rose was saying about thinking about, for example, indigenous environmental justice all the way back to removals and the deep history of, of colonization and empire in the places from which we write and think that it does something to use the particular phrase, the particular term environmental justice to think about that relation. Murphy, do you wanna add something? Yeah, a lot has been said already. And, and um, just to, to build on what's been said, um, what I heard is, is that everyone was starting from a particular place and thinking about what is environmental justice. And, um, you know, so in thinking about that question, I have to think about the lower Great Lakes I have to think about this as a territory that's not just Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory, which has its own forms of in specific forms of indigenous law, as well as um, forms of treaty between Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people about how to live on the Great Lakes. But it's also the lower Great Lakes, you know, on the, the upper side is Canada, the southern side is more 
the United States. It is a, a place where Black and Indigenous struggle around land body and relations touch upon one another, shape one another, the question of these kind of long, um, a long project of solidarities uh, is taking place, it's, as well as it's a diasporic space where there's uh, um, people who have, have come to live on the Lower Great Lakes from all around the world who bring particular lamb body political uh, traditions in their own struggles against colonialism and racism and capitalism um, into a place like Toronto or Detroit or the other kind of Chicago or the other kind of places, Cleveland around this territory. And so, um, and so it's this kind of um, space out of which like the question of like, what is environmental justice like kind of comes an ongoing question of solidarity um, that has to like always recognize that it's been going this kind of a uh, project has been going on from the very beginning of the arrival of colonialism onto the lower Great Lakes. And then maybe the other thing I would add is for me, environmental justice is so intimately connected to reproductive justice. It is land body relations. Um, and, you know, when Beth Rose talks about intergenerational um, relations, when um, you know, Malcolm's talking about glyphosate and we can think about like agriculture and food relations. Like these are all reproductive justice issues. And so um, for me, these environmental justice and reproductive justice go together. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is that um, reproductive or environmental justice, um, sometimes I get very tempted to think about environmental justice as primarily about like land defense, body defense against, you know, environmental violence. Um, but I think environmental justice has also a desire based dimension to it, right? It also has a, a positive um, speculative dimension about people um, working in community and solidarity to try to um, to make our land body supports otherwise. And so, um, you know, when we talk about justice in that way, I really like the way both Malcolm and Beth Rose, you know, right away uh, questioned, you know, the idea of like looking to the state for the settler state or any kind of colonial state as like the site of justice or even looking to like academic ethics as the site of justice. Um, as opposed to looking at something like indigenous law as a site of justice or even something like um, speculative future making and solidarities across decolonial traditions as like a, a kind of desire based justice. So um, yeah, so I, I thank Malcolm and Beth Rose for what they said. Yeah, I think um, that's really, I really appreciate that framing as well, the desire-based dimension of environmental justice. We talked about that a lot in my class, you know, in our first day of class, we were talking about what does environmental justice mean to you? And a lot of students initially said, well, I have to talk about injustice first. And we got, um, you know, class got pretty heavy, pretty quick. And then as we went on and learned about environmental justice movements, um, particularly on the Gulf Coast and the Deep South, we started talking a lot about solidarity. And in talking about solidarity, particularly in movements led from African-American communities facing toxic exposure um, in Louisiana and in Eastern Texas, we ended up talking a lot about the forms of solidarity that are specific to those communities and the places where people who had never organized before and had never taken political action in this way before came together. And so I think this idea of thinking about environmental justice, not just as a reaction to harm, but as a, a positive formation that is grounded in actual acts and practices of solidarity is really important. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that or I can move on to a related question. All right, so, in relation to, to how we've been talking about um, the sort of positive or world building sense of environmental, the practice of environmental justice, 
I'm thinking specifically about decolonization and decoloniality and of decolonization as a practice that is part of the building of that positive speculative vision of environmental justice. So I'm wondering if you could each speak to how decolonization um, informs your work and that could be conceptually, empirically, uh, practically. And I'm interested to hear uh, what is specifically decolonial about the way that you think about environmental justice or the way that it can operate in the world. You know, Malcolm, since this is in the title of your book, perhaps we could start with you. <laughs> oh, it's it's um it's it's a it's a broad question. Um, but to to piggyback on what I was saying, I I I was brought up and especially the education I received at school um, kind of established a wall between issues that are actually very much intertwined, but that were kept separate. And I was told to, to think, or I was shown to think about uh, both colonization and decolonization only in a political uh, perspective, social perspective, even, even the intimate sphere perspective, to put it on one side. <clears throat> and then I was told that, okay, the environmental change history of the Caribbean in America, so of the environmental issues of, of or history of the world were something separate. And, and, and you can see the separation in a number of concepts today, like the Anthropocene, like uh, and environmental ethics, or, or the gen genealogy of environmental thoughts, where a number of well-known scholars will talk about um, uh, and I'm told philosophy without mentioning colonization or slavery, which is a, uh, uh, and I think the decolonial ecology or the way I, I, I use decolonial theory and decolonial work is precisely to go beyond that double fracture, to, to bring it together and understand that uh, a true ecological approach to the world cannot do away with an understanding and a challenging of the history of the colonization, of the modern history of colonization and, and, and slavery and, and the ongoing imperialism. As a matter of fact, there is a tendency to uh, observe with admiration, to, to, to celebrate the lifestyle and, and, and the, the, the world visions of indigenous people around the world without um acknowledging the the political domination that induces some of their uh um the historical colonization that induces some of their contemporary domination today so on the one hand we want to celebrate the environmental aspect of it the way the, the way they they are able to live within with, with in, in relation to their local environment and, and but on the other hand we failed, or a bit amiss, at, at least some people failed to recognize their demands for justice, their demand for better living conditions. And why is that, especially from the French context? It's because collectively, in terms of the collective French imaginary, there is a reluctance to uh, reluctancy, I don't know, to, um, to acknowledge the history of, of slavery, to acknowledge the history of colonization. And what's even more disturbing today is that if you want to tackle this and not just as a history project to be dealt with in the history class, then you are called um, to be, you are, you are told to be anti-Republican. So again, for me, decoloniality and decolonial work in ecological issues allows me to, to bring the two together and the, and the understanding that you cannot achieve full decolonization without also challenging the way you've been dealing with the land, with the ecosystem, the way you've been relating collectively as a society to the land. But likewise, you cannot achieve a, a, a truly ecological society without understanding how this coloniality has been dictating the way the land was managed. So it's trying to bridge a gap on both points. I might jump in there. 
I really appreciate the way, uh, Malcolm, you talked about acknowledging history. And I was hearing from you too, not only as in the past, but as intertwined with the present. I think that's what I, I tried to bring that out in my book upstream in talking about the history of the development of water infrastructure in California. And, and the displacement that occurred of indigenous peoples, Maidu peoples in particular at the headwaters of the state water project is still in place and really not acknowledged and certainly not acknowledged in any way that links to an understanding of infrastructure. I think sometimes our discussions of, of, of history fall into uh, more humanities dialogues rather than linking to natural resources and environmental policy where the decisions continue to be made that reproduce those, his, those inequities that were established in the past. So often when I talk about decoloniality, I talk about towards a decolonial future. How do we move towards that? Because we are so entwined with this in infrastructure that comes out of a colonial mindset that there's a lot of steps to go to unpack that and address it in the institutions that we you know, rely on for something so basic as turning on the tap. You know, some of us who are listening might be thinking about that right now in terms of dealing with um, not having water at the moment due to storms. How does this infrastructure come to be and, and who lost in that process? And then I look for places of, uh, of intervention you know, in the in the process of doing the research for upstream and looking at all of these archives about the dispossession of lands to develop this water infrastructure. Uh, at the same time, there was a process with the power company to apply to get some of these, these lands could be put into conservation ownership. So it was an opportunity to intervene in that process, which it's not itself decolonial, but it was an opportunity to bring out that history, talk about the link to the present, and then really articulate what a decolonial future could look like and how different people could be involved in building that. Um, I love hearing uh, uh, everything that, uh, that Beth Rose and Malcolm are saying and uh, just to kind of, I feel like there's just so much resonance. So, um, you know, working on the lower Great Lakes, of course, environmentalist, environmental violence here is rooted in white supremacy. It's rooted in the arrival of the settler state. It's rooted in the imposition of property. It's rooted in anti-blackness and it's rooted in indigenous elimination. Working on Chemical Valley, Chemical Valley big, um, has the oldest running refinery in the world, which is um, began in 1870. It, Chemical Valley itself is 150 years old, so it's, it basically mirrors the arrival of the colonial Canadian state. Um, so the, the question of pollution in that place is a question of colonialism, right? And the question and the way that the settler state has created conditions that uh, give permission to do violence on the land and people. So the state is totally culpable in the creation of this long history of environmental. We can look on the other side of the, the, the water is like Detroit, it's Michigan, right? So this is like white supremacy, petrochemical um, capitalism. And you know, it's always interesting to talk to people in Houston because we're in two kind of refining petrochemical areas that are kind of shaped by uh, interacting histories, right across like these two sites in Ontario and, and Houston. And so as you think about like, what is then a decolonial dimension to like the work of addressing this pollution? Well, one, it is address, it is in a way trying to unseat a way of thinking about pollution as not about colonialism, right? It's about trying to say, yes, pollution is fundamentally about colonialism and racism. So that's, and then secondly, to be very careful in appealing to the settler state as the place where you're looking for amelioration of pollution, right? Because every time, I mean, we can look to like, you know, thinking about like, you know, the tradition Malcolm's working in. We, Franz Fanon long pointed out the double bind that as soon as you say, yes, we want your environmental regulation, we'll say, okay, that justifies the imposition of our colonial rule, right? So that double bind is in that 
gesture of turning to the settler state. Um, so, you know, the question of like, what's a, de a decolonial uh, um, environmental justice is a tricky one, because on the one hand, yes, you have to do harm reduction. You have to do immediate survival and harm reduction, which might involve dealing with the settler state, right? But there is exactly like Beth Rose says, that longer horizon, right? The decolonial horizon, which you're working in relationship to generations before you. You, you, have, you probably understand yourself as working for generations yet to come because we don't think like the decolonial is gonna arrive like in our lives kind of thing. Um, but there will be an end to Chemical Valley in its, in its current form, right? Um, and then for me, it's like also just, um, it can get very nerdy and deep. So for us, um, you know, I run a lab, we work on the question of like chemical pollution. Um, so the question of like how to like have glimmers of decolonial reality here and now without waiting for better conditions. So in terms of how do we come together? How, what, how do we um, manifest language, like Anishinaabe language in our lab? How, who is in our lab, right? Whose knowledges get to, to be there? How do we hold a meeting? How do we treat data? You know, all these things, ask your question, what is land? Right, these kinds of things, and then, and then I, I personally get very nerdy with the question of like, what's a chemical? If we, if we kind of come to the question of what is land, and and answer it from like Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee um, understandings, then the question too of like, what's a chemical, and what's chemical pollution has to be really rethought in relationship to a whole different set of knowledges than the ones that came out of engineering extraction, the settler state and so on, which, you know, kind of gives us our kind of current understanding of chemical pollution. So we can get super nerdy on, I think, decolonial uh, practices in terms of like the real details of how we know pollution, how we know harm. And then we can also, you know, get um, kind of very social about it. Like how do we come together, even just in this like webinar? How do we come together in a good way, even in our kind of small gestures in the here and now? And then there's like that big horizon, right? That we understand ourselves as working in and towards. So um, yeah, so I kind of, I feel like what Malcolm and Beth Rose are saying, um, uh, um, even as we work in different places, I hear so much connection across trying to think about like, what is a decolonial environment? I, I I really like what um, what has been said. Um, I like the, the notion of in intervention. I mean, we, we we can talk about what decolonial or decolonial environmental justice means, but in some instance, um, in some instances, and the, the the places from which I talk today, ushering the name the word decolonial is itself an activist stance. Um, it, in France right now, you can be, um, like the, the, the police can have uh, data on you because of your philosophical opinion. It, 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 it's a decree that was passed three, three weeks ago. And at the same time, the divide that I was talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning the impact that this divide has on the generation that is coming and the choice that this generation is doing in terms of their studies. And so you have a lot of people, like one of the common saying, oh yeah, we never see black and Arabic people doing environmental studies or so on and so forth. And at the same time, you prevent some of these people to engage in the way they see fit with environmental issues. So to me, all decolonial, decolonial, decolonial uh, environmental justice is also about creating a space that would allow a, a more diverse crowd to engage with these issues, especially from wherever you are, but especially here, here in Paris or, or here in Martinique or here, or here, or here, here in France. <laughs> yeah.
Mm, I think uh, to add to that, I really appreciate how you all are seeking to make those spaces in your work, right? And so Murphy was talking about the environmental data justice lab as a place where it matters who's in the lab and it matters what work you're doing and it matters how you express that work to, to which audience. And similarly to how Beth Rose was talking about, you know, the way that policy works or the way that you engage with um, policy change. And Beth Rose mentioned the idea of like moving the table. I really appreciated that phrase as a way of understanding how those points that we might create in our work that move us towards the decolonial horizon they matter in the place where they are as well, not just as a, a future oriented place, but as a place where, as Malcolm was saying, people gather and engage concretely with how to make justice in the present. Beth, did you have anything to add there? I really like the way you brought all of that together. Um, I didn't have anything to add to that point, but I noticed a, a question in the Q&A. Let me have a look at it. Yeah, so um, for our audience, the question asks if we could talk about um, the co colonialization of our global food system and link it to environmental racism. I wonder if anybody wants to jump in on that. You know, particularly, I think of that in having worked in the Caribbean, I very much think of that. Um, I know the question asker also works in Haiti as, as I do. Um, yeah, anybody have thoughts about global food system or environmental justice as related to food justice? I, I can give just uh, one example. Um, up until 2012, so the same products um, that were sold, the same yogurt, the same Coke, Pepsi, well, not very good food, but all good drinks, but that were sold in like continental France, were sold in Martinique, Guadeloupe, La Réunion, and other mountain territories, and, and, and French Guiana. However, for some obscure reason, the, the very same product, the same name would have 30 to 50 percent more sugar than in continental France. So the same product, the same country, the same citizens, same rights, same passport, we have no different passport, but one who would have more sugar um, in, the, um, in their food. And one thing is, is um, that we have twice as much um, obesity rate as continental France. And another example of that colonization of, of the food system is the fact that we have designated some islands to be banana, banana islands. This production has created a contamination of the islands. Nine, more than 95% of the people are contaminated with dangerous chemicals. And these are islands, so you can't go around and you can escape, you can es es escape that. And that, to me, there are two examples of how um, through the foods, and again, a, a system that does not secure, not give any kind of food security, but poison people, uh, put a, a heavy body burden uh, with a lot of inequalities. Yeah, thank you, Malcolm. I mean, I think I'm also, thinking about that question in relation to uh, a way far back history, like when Beth Rose uh, spoke in her introductory remarks talking about the contamination from gold mining and its continuing impacts um, on mercury contamination and people, fisher folk whose livelihoods depend on, um, on fishing. And so I think that might not be the sense of colonization of our food system that the, the question asker was referencing per se, but I think to understand it in that bigger sense is really important. So extractive capitalism um, in all senses shapes the development of a global food system from different directions. And 
that has impacts that continue into the present and impact livelihoods of people who are experiencing uh, undue environmental harms and burdens. Yes, thank you so much. If I could just add on a little bit there. I've been thinking lately about uh, these categories of beneficial uses of water, which allow you to then establish water quality standards to achieve those beneficial uses. And so in California, there's been a process to recognize cultural uses uh, and subsistence uses on water bodies. And if you take into account that people are eating a high amount of fish from a local river, then the water quality standard needs to be higher than it was previously when it was just measured by you know, a distant urban user who maybe never ate fish out of that river. So it, it's a way through, through working through the food system and the perspectives of, of those who are often left out of the conversation that you can then impact the, the policy to ensure greater safety for people reliant on, on the foods. I was also thinking about, uh, you know, in relation to the, the cultural burning, the fire and the image behind me, you know, fire is one stewardship tool that people use to care for food plants, uh, traditional foods, as well as to make space and good browse and good habitat for animals that can be hunted as well. But those practices of land stewardship have either been criminalized in as they have been in the past or uh, denied through jurisdictional frameworks and the division of lands. And so the, I guess, uh, distancing people from their local food system you know, became really expressed through environmental policy. So I would encourage us to think about those those local food systems as well and the ways they've been impacted by laws that don't recognize that people still have these ways of relating to the land and ways of, of taking care of the land and relying on the land for producing foods locally. Uh, maybe I'll just like add another twist to thinking about that, which is, um, you know, in, of course, in Chemical Valley, um, the pollution affects like the non-humans, right? The, the fish and the birds and the reptiles and the plants and so on. Um, and, you know, there is a long tradition of trying to um, you know, prove the reality of that, of the intensity of that environmental justice by like trying to represent that harm, right? To, um, you know, fish, to food waste, to health. Um, and um, that's, imp that's important work. But then sometimes with that work, what happens is then the humans and non-humans most affected by the violence have to bear the burden of representing environmental injustice. And so when we think about the global food system, we can think about what does it mean to take those, that knowledge that we have about that harm of chemical pollutants and attach it back to what we could call the perpetrators. And you know, if we look at an important company like Monsanto, right, which um, you know, is the producer of glyphosate, which Malcolm mentioned, which is, you know, the, cre the you know, an insister of on um, the global uh, uh, distribution or instantiation of laws that make um, commodified, restrict people to commodified seed use and, and um, reduce people's capacity to have diversified um, seed and plant traditions in their food making. If we look at Monsanto, Monsanto as a kind of seed company and pesticide company started out as a chemical company, right? And they made uh, polychlorinated biphenyls and um, they made Agent Orange. And so, um, you know, we all, all humans alive today have the chemicals made by Monsanto in our bodies and our development, all humans a lot, pretty well all humans alive today, our very physiology and development has been shaped by Monsanto, right? So when we think about Monsanto, we can think about big petrochemical companies that also are involved in making fertilizers and pesticides. Maybe we can think about big companies like ExxonMobil. We're talking about big multinational companies that are the important um, perpetrators of disruptions to our capacity to live, including to eat well. That, and so 
you know, the kind of question of like decolonial tactics and, and um, you know, it happens at many scales. And I think it also happens in terms of like, what does it mean for trans, uh, trans um, spatial, trans place-based solidarities around shared perpetrators, which do not only include colonial state powers like France or the United States or Canada, but also these big multinationals, which have um, worked, hand, the company and the state have worked together <laughs> in these ways. And so that's like just another kind of way in um, to thinking about how this is maybe connected. Just, just to follow what you were um, saying about these, the, the solidarities, not just against the form of colonial state, but against international. I don't know if you've heard of that, that woman, Tran, Tran Tonga. She's basically a, um, one of the only Vietnamese and French citizen. And because the Vietnamese could not get justice because of the Agent Orange that was sent there, she managed to um, try to sue some of the American companies using the French system. And I think that was an interesting example of how you can go around and, and, and build these, these solidarities through different spaces and states, yeah. And one of the students I work with, uh, Rohini Patel is working on how Agent Orange was manufactured just outside of Toronto. So the, there's so many solidarities to make. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking about that also in the context of, uh, I think Murphy made the, the claim, right? That pollution is fundamentally about colonialism and imperialism. And so understanding the spatial dimensions of that as something that is globally entwined with food systems, economic systems. Um, actually, we've talked about this a lot in the geographer, you know, I, I sort of uh, imbue my class with spatial thinking. We've talked about this a lot in my class as well. And I think something that is really powerful to me in thinking about the relation between your work is how intimately each of you are writing from and about particular places, but the, the sort of spatial dimensions of the connections between those places that are coming out so clearly. Um, I had a question that goes in a little bit of a different direction, um, although I, I can see ways in which it also fits into this, uh, as we've just been discussing. But I'm thinking about how you do your work methodologically. And, you know, we have um, Malcolm, you're trained, right, as an environmental engineer and in political science, and uh, Beth Rose has done work on environmental policy and management um, and on law, and Murphy uh, runs the Environmental Data Justice Lab, but also is a historian of science and technology. And so I'm wondering about um, archives and what you see sort of as your archive in thinking about justice, environmental justice. And to think about that in kind of a meta way, how, how the colonial or imperial histories of those archives in turn shape your work. I don't know if anyone's ready to jump in. Uh, Malcolm, were you about to speak or, or Murphy? Okay. Well, I might just share quickly a, a way I just used an archival piece that was something that I had looked at many times. So, so just to give a little background um, for the upstream project about the history of, of state water infrastructure and indigenous lands at the headwaters, I spent a lot of time in the federal archives, in particular Bureau of Indian Affairs archives, as well as Bureau of Land Management, but also a lot of small local archives, which were not necessarily recorded, uh, but where there were a lot of useful bits of information. But some of the information from the federal archives really you know, documented the way agencies were thinking about land and people and uh, sort of manipulating land and people in order to achieve greater greater capital and development over time. And so the absences who was whose voices were not there and what was not discussed was is also as interesting as what you do find in the archives. 
so I was just sharing with a group at UC Berkeley this uh, archive I had from the Forest Service that listed all of these indigenous people who, and it was just after the Forest Service had formed, so like two years after this public agency had declared these indigenous lands to be public lands. And the archive enumerates each of these people where they live and says they should be perhaps given a permit to live there. And it was really striking because I was just thinking, what would it be like if this was your home and all of a sudden the agency is there and about to issue you a permit and constrain your area in some way and assume some authority to grant you the right to be there. And I just thought about how uh, not too far that is from some of the processes I've encountered recently when when people need to apply to access, you know, areas within their homelands, or they need to request a certain type of permit to have an event or a ceremony in a, in a traditional place, uh, that, you know, it's important to bring out these archives because they, sh they show in full relief, you know, the, the coloniality of these decisions and frameworks that were made, and then how they have not changed very much, and how we really need to call them out as part of pushing against them and, and transforming some of those systems. I could just say that we work with a lot of archival material as well as um, federal and provincial data and reports. And, um, you know, it's very, you know, I think like to build on what Beth Rose is saying, we don't look at that as evidence of what happened. It's the evidence of the bad faith of the settler state. So, you know, when the data shows that the company is not polluting too badly, but the community has a lot of knowledge and expertise about how the company has changed the land and the health effects, et cetera. The archival evidence is the evidence of the state's erasure of its own violence. And so it's really complicated to use archival, you know, state related archival materials when it comes to the study of environmental violence. And so like the question, you know, what's your archive? You know, this is why it's like really important to, I think, um, temper um, or or kind of also really manifest other kinds of expertise and knowledges, some of which are not at all written, um, but are very lived and very intergenerational about what happened. Um, but also to like, also consider like, you know, the rocks and the trees and the river um, and these other kind of really um, enduring presences as also kind of giving us a pedagogy of what happened. Um, so there's just a, a few thoughts I think build on what Beth Rose is saying. Um, I, I totally uh, uh, um, follow what, what uh, Michelle just said. Um, so because I, I'm, part of my work includes trying to find out where some of the chemicals has been used. So I, I do look at different types of archives. Um, but also um, archives of um, scientific societies for, 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 for the states. Um, and you have to look at it. Um, but there are so many things you can do with archives, looking at authorships, the different what's there, what's not there. But look, picking back on what um, Michel said, there are also archives that are not written. And one of the archives that I find it's just out there in, in Martin in Guadeloupe is, is the land itself. Um, it's, it's very peculiar because for me, modern, modernity has created this myth of the um, astronaut, astronaut man, some who walk, walks in the long landscape feeling like he or she is not, is not there. So if you are in Martinique and you take the road, you see on the left, a sugar sugarcane field, you see on the on the right a banana plantation, but you you were you would be told to believe that you are somewhat away from the plantation. It's the plantation is on the left and on the right, and then hmm, suddenly 
we realized that the pesticides that were used on both sides are in your body. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the archives just there, you know, it, the, the, the land tells you something and actually the land tells you that you are connected, the body is connected to, to, to the land. So these are some of the ways um, I, I, I looked at um, our archives. But one other thing I, in, in my work, especially when, because of the history of environmental thought in which when I started, there were not many black environmental thinkers or black environmental theorists. I, I, I look to, of course, I, I did a lot of interviews with, um, with local NGOs, with uh, local activists, um, but, I, but I also look to artists and writers that I consider as, as somewhat uh, archivists of the imaginary, in the sense that they are able to capture things that you know you would not be able to demonstrate scientifically but still has some sort of reality or validity that is important for your work yeah <laughs> one of one of the things i do things for in, in in my book is i looked at to into the names of slave ships and, and i use the names of slave ships as a material to understand our contemporary relation to the world and, and the earth. Just different possibilities there. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think we are nearing the, the end of our time tonight. Um, I'm going to put my rice email in the chat and if anybody in the audience or anybody who watches this later um, wants to submit questions and i can try and coordinate um, this ongoing conversation um, and again there's also the center for environmental studies uh, website where you will be able to find this recording um, in the future i'll also put that link in again so I am just, I learned so much from this conversation. I think it was, it was so marvelous and so inspiring to me. Um, you know, I, I, especially thinking about the phrase Malcolm used near the end, um, working with archivists or archives of the imaginary. I think that's really important for the way I think about my work and some connections between our work as well. Um, so I really appreciate everybody's contribution to this discussion really wonderful. Um, so as I said before, uh, we generally have Planet Now webinars um, at 6 p.m. Central Time on Mondays. The next one is on March 1st, and it is on the topic of cultures and media and environmental health with Heather Hauser and Alexa Shotwell. Um, we do hope that you'll be able to join us again. I know I'm so Grateful that our guests will also be able to meet some of our students at Rice as well next week. So thank you so much um, for your generous time. And um, I'm sure everybody is clapping right now, but I'll just clap on everybody's behalf. Thank you so much. <laughs>